Do you have less than 10 minutes to learn something new? The Latin Learner Podcast offers helpful information from experts in the school community on a wide variety of topics. The clock starts now, so let's get started. We don't teach computer science in a vacuum, right? We're never teaching computer science and computational thinking skills in one day in one lesson. There's no lesson we can point to that says, today is the computational thinking lesson, right? It's really just woven into our curriculum and woven into the way that students solve problems. While using words like decomposition and abstraction with even my JK students, so they, when they were doing something um, and they break it down into smaller parts or they're taking pieces out that no longer make sense, whatever they're doing, that just having that exposure to that language even when they're four or five years old. When I was in school, I just felt like everything was just disjointed knowledge. I walk into a one class and I've got to learn their thing and then another class and it's their thing. And it just all felt disjointed. And so as we integrate computational thinking, at least kids are able to see like, oh, it's the same skills. I'm applying them in different ways. I'm Ash Hansberry. I am an upper school computer science teacher and I am also the department chair for the computer science department. I'm Bobby Uman, middle school computer science teacher. I'm Fiona Dini, the lower school computer science and technology integration specialist. Computational thinking is really just a set of skills, a set of thought processes around organizing problems in a strategic, organized way. So when we're thinking about computational thinking, we're thinking, how do I take a problem and break it down in such a way that a computer could understand it? So that means something like breaking a problem that is big into a bunch of little pieces, developing algorithms or instructions for how you would solve that problem. And then things like finding potential bugs or errors or ways that your solution might go wrong so that you can refine your solution and make sure that it is bug-free and clear enough that any computer could understand it. How do skills in computational thinking allow students to solve complex problems? So as Ash mentioned, uh, there are several components of computational thinking. One is problem decomposition. And so that's really just taking a problem and breaking it down into its smaller parts. Um, secondly, uh, pattern recognition. So identifying patterns and then being able to forecast or predict what would happen next. And then the third one is then developing an algorithm. So what is the step-by-step -step way to solve this problem? So I think that you know those three things alone are huge uh, in helping students to solve complex problems because oftentimes a kid will look at a problem and just say like, I don't know, like, what do I do next? And so helping a kid say, well, what are the different parts of this problem? What, what do you see as like the discrete parts of this problem? Um, and then helping them talk through like, well, I first see that I'm going to have to have this, you know, I, I first see this, this like different section. So like, if they can even start to like parse out like the different things, then it's not like this overwhelming, like large problem to solve, but now it's like smaller components. Um, and so I think that's really huge. And then when the kids start to identify patterns, they're able to like make predictions and, well, I think this is going to happen next, or, well, I see these patterns applying to this section of the problem and this section of the problem, but not this section of the problem. And so again, what I've seen at least in the middle school is students getting overwhelmed by the size of a problem and not knowing where to start and computational thinking helps them to see like, there are manageable pieces to this problem that you can now um, attack. And I would say that I've seen the same thing in the upper school as well, that one of the biggest benefits is this ability to know how to tackle a problem, right? I've said this to students before. If you can solve a problem in a way that computers can understand, you can be really confident that you know how to start the problem, you know the steps in the middle, you know how to finish the problem. Like this level of detail that goes into thinking like a computer can help students to really be able to uh, take something that might overwhelm them and make it manageable. How does computational thinking fit into every subject of study? 
to build on what Ash and Bobby just said, I think about the idea for a lower schooler of writing a story. You think about the specific components. It may feel like a large problem at the time when you're sort of thinking about that initial idea, but you have a deliberate sequence of how you put your story together and you have a goal in mind as you write. In the editing process, you take out the pieces that no longer make sense and you refine the story to get to your final product. So you're taking that big problem and you're breaking it down into smaller steps, taking out pieces that you no longer need and um, thinking about the sequence as you put it together. I, I would also say that, you know, in the middle school, we often talk as teachers about like, we're all just helping kids solve problems and our problems look different in different subjects, but um, computational thinking like goes across the board. and. And so we talk often as uh, middle school teachers, as far as um, integrating computational thinking is are things that we've done as teachers our whole lives. Now we're just giving common wording so that when they go into another class or another class or another class, they're like, oh, this is the problem decomposition part. Oh, this is the, this is the abstraction part. Oh, th so there's at least a common terminology. And so kids don't feel like I'm doing something totally new in math versus language arts versus et cetera. And just to build on that, Bobby, as well, using words like decomposition and abstraction with even my JK students. So they, when they were doing something um, and they break it down into smaller parts or they're taking pieces out that no longer make sense, whatever they're doing, that just having that exposure to that language, even when they're four or five years old, gives them that common, they hear that common language all throughout school. And, and I would say that that common language that Fiona was mentioning is like one of the strengths of having computational thinking built into our whole program, JK to 12. That's something I think is really val valuable about our department is that we can introduce these concepts in computer science in junior kindergarten, but then they see them in English in lower school and they see them in science and they see them again in middle school and they can keep revisiting these same terms and these same ideas. They'll these computational thinking skills, these computer science skills, really over their whole career with us here at Latin. I will speak from the I perspective. When I was in school, I just felt like everything was just disjointed knowledge that, you know, like I walk into a one class and I've got to learn their thing and then another class and it's their thing. And it just all felt disjointed. And so um, as we integrate computational thinking to Ash's point, to Fiona's point, at least kids are able to see like, oh, it's the same skills, I'm applying them in different ways. How do you build interest in thinking skills and integrate them into the curriculum? So I think this question is really answered by the fact that we don't teach computer science in a vacuum, right? We're never teaching computer science and computational thinking skills in one day in one lesson. There's no lesson we can point to that says, today is the computational thinking lesson, right? It's really just woven into our curriculum and woven into the way that students solve problems. So when we're talking about a specific skill in class, maybe we're talking about debugging, right? Finding the errors in a program. We're looking at a specific program that does something, right? So we can take, maybe this is a program that's trying to calculate a problem they saw in math class, right? And we can look for the bugs in that program that they saw in math class. So it's really woven into the program. Whatever a student might be interested in, maybe they really like math class, maybe they really like art class, right? We can use these venues of where students are interested uh, as the problems we approach in class. You know, that is why I think in the upper school, and I know we do it in the middle and lower as well, we like to show students example programs that come from all these different disciplines. Right. If we're practicing debugging skills, maybe one day we're debugging that math program, but maybe another day it's a program that draws a picture and they can apply those same skills for a new program. But this time it connects more to the kids with an art interest or maybe uh, they can use that same program to study animals, you know, and the kids who like biology have a connection. So because the skills are so transferable, we really get uh, to hook all the kids. Right. We get an interested kid no matter where they're coming from, no matter where their interest started, they can find a hook into computer science through all of our different projects. I'll add on to that as well. I think kids, uh, and I think all of us think our kids are inherently problem solvers and they're looking for good problems to solve. And if you can give them a problem that is engaging, like they're willing to jump in, then we can start to talk about like, well, how would we solve this with a computer? So for example, 
one of the problems we start with in the middle school is you've invited 20 friends to a party. Here's the three tables. You've got to have them sit at the tables, but wait, these friends are in conflict and these people are friends. So how would you organize your tables? And then they, they come up with an algorithm and they come up with a reason why they would seat people the way that they would be seated. Um, and then we start to break that down even further. And so we can say like, you're, you're solving problems all the time and these are relevant problems. Now, how do we get a computer to, because teachers use websites like randomseatingchart.org, a computer has solved that and just taken what you've just thought about and made it into an actual program. Next time on the Latin Learner Podcast. And I've seen students make models on everything from students looking at climate change to students trying to model traffic in the cafeteria here at Latin, uh, to students trying to model, you know, coronavirus and how it changed people's movement around the city. We talked about algorithmic bias. Where is this data coming from for this AI? Why could AI recognize white faces and not recognize black faces? White uh, people blinking, but not Asian people. Not just bias, but then all of a sudden it becomes discrimination. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Latin Learner Podcast. Check out other episodes on our website at latinschool.org slash podcast.